Our call to worship is 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 23 through 29. We will do this section of God's word in a responsive reading fashion. This is God's word. God is calling us to worship through it. So let's keep both of those things in mind. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, how many times we have come to a worship service like this and we have not worshiped. We perhaps have gone through uh, the outward manifestations of worship, but uh, in reality, in our hearts, with our lives, we really did not worship. And Heavenly Father, you are to be worshiped. We are to ascribe to you the glory due your name. And so we bow before you right now, Heavenly Father, and ask, would you please be here in such a way that we do worship, that you lead us in worshiping you, that we do honor you. And through honoring you, we experience a blessing from you in our lives. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hymn number 282, which is in your bulletin, I greet thee, who my sure redeemer art.
Thy loving kindness, Lord, is good and free. Psalm 69, we will sing that next. Confession is taken from Luke chapter 11. Let me read the words that you have before you in your bulletin. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, and forgive us our sins. Among a number of things, Jesus said to them, in reference to when you pray, say, one of the things very specifically is that we should pray for the forgiveness of our sins. So we're going to do that now. But before we do that together out loud, I'd like you to spend a minute or two with the confession of sin that we're going to use. Please uh, look it over, seek to understand it, make it yours so that when we do pray it together out loud, uh, we, are, uh, we are really praying it. We're really asking the Lord for forgiveness. So take a minute. Uh, to look over the confession of sin.
Let's pray together. Most merciful God, whose eyes are too pure to behold iniquity, and who has promised forgiveness to all who confess and forsake their sin. We come before you with a humble sense of our own unworthiness and with the acknowledgement of our manifold transgressions of your righteous laws. But, O oh gracious Father, who does not desire the death of a sinner, look upon us, we beseech you, in mercy, and forgive all our transgressions. Make us deeply sensible of their great evil, and work in us a heart of contrition, that we may obtain forgiveness at your hands, who is ever ready to receive humble and penitent sinners for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our only Savior and Redeemer. Amen. The assurance of pardon is a very, very familiar verse in the Bible, so familiar that perhaps we are numb to appreciating it. But uh, with God's help, let's appreciate this assurance of pardon. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's stand and sing together, He Will Hold Me Fast. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would
be seated. Please join me in uh, confessing your faith in the true faith in Christianity. And we'll use the Apostles' Creed to do this. Let's uh, together confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'm going to read at this time Psalm 13. Uh, please take a Bible and uh, turn to Psalm 13. I will be uh, utilizing the early version of the New International Version for reading this section of God's Word, but I invite you to uh, take a Bible, whatever translation that might be, and open up to Psalm 13. Once again, a Psalm of David written under the inspiration of the Lord God. Hear the word of God. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O oh Lord my God, give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. The Word of God. Jim is going to come and lead us in prayer at this time. In Psalm 5, verse 3, we read, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. How true that is in prayer. Let's uh, go to the Lord as a, a church now. Father, we thank you for uh, allowing us to come together. It's, uh, it's uh, so uh, crazy the way things are going and it's hard to know what's right, and how to go about it. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that he's here empowering us with each one of us, Lord, our hearts, the struggles that we might be going through, the, uh, uh, the challenges uh, where we are so often alone. And, uh, but we have your word, Lord, that is there to comfort us, and we pray that that might be the case. We know different families, things have been brought before us. We uh, pray for Mary Alice and the challenges she's going through. 
Jane and the, the health challenges she has and, and Mel, we pray for them. Betty, uh, as she, Betty Hall, as she is uh, preparing to meet with doctors and Lord, we pray that there might be surgery to address her heart problems. Kathy, as she waits for uh, surgery and, and preparing for that and the heart problems that she addresses. Lord, I know each one of us have different challenges, people we know and family members, Lord, that... Uh, we bring before you daily and we lift them up before you now. Lord, we thank you for meeting the needs of this church uh, that uh, finances come in. We're able to meet challenges outside the church here that are brought before us and the different outreaches we have. Lord, you've blessed us and we thank you that we can meet those obligations. We pray for our church staff and the challenges of uh, running a, uh, the church the way is, it's going on. And uh, we, we pray for strength in that. Keep us healthy, Lord, and keep us wise in how we go about things. Lord, we pray for our country, the unrest that's out there, uh, the I don't know, the anarchy, whatever the, the, that we see and uh, so much that's going on, Lord. We, we pray for our, the police and the, uh, the struggles that they are going through trying to uh, serve our country. Help us, Lord, to understand. Help us to uh, encourage those around us, our neighbors, our family, and... Uh, that we can represent you well, Father. And we thank you for Christ, that he's with us now and going forward. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jerry Bridges is a ruling elder in our denomination, in our PCA denomination, and he has written a number of uh, truly excellent books ministering to uh, believers and seeking to minister to unbelievers as well. I am utilizing uh, one of his books, one of his chapters, uh, a great deal this morning in bringing you this message. Jerry Bridges, once again, is his name. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, this uh, is a time where uh, we ask for you to uh, pour out a working of your spirit in our lives, in our homes, in our churches, in our relationships. Uh, you have given us your word, and your word is so important. May the importance of your word be evident to us this morning, and from this time of preaching, be evident to us in the days, weeks, and months to come. Oh, Heavenly Father, we uh, ask for your glory uh, to be had through this time. In Jesus' name, amen. A Christian man who spends a good amount of time encouraging others found himself distraught over the spiritual struggles of one of his children. In desperation, he cried out, God, I think I'm doing a better job taking care of your children 
than you are of mine. He said, as soon as I uttered those words, I repented to the Lord. Let me ask you, have you ever questioned God's love for you? Have you ever doubted his goodness, his kindness to you? Another Christian man has said, once when one of my children was going through a series of difficult experiences, I said, God, I wouldn't treat my child the way you are treating her. Meaning, what are you doing? He also said, I repented of my brash words. Most of us are tempted from time to time to question God's love for us. This morning, we are going to look at some truths about God to store up in our hearts to use, if you will, as weapons against temptations to doubt his love. We are going to look at four truths about God that will help us to know God's love and goodness for us, his people. Again, four truths about God that will help us to know God's love and goodness for us, his people. Here is truth number one. God shows his love for us at Calvary. Take a Bible, open your Bible to 1 John chapter 4, and notice with me verses 9 and 10. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The evidence that John gives to us for God's love for us is God sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. God shows, God proves his love for us at Calvary. What would you say your greatest need is? What is the need of your life? Health? Financial security? To have friends? To have freedom from adversity? Your greatest need is to be right with God. Your biggest need is to have your eternal separation from God removed and to be reconciled to him. This need is so great that no other need can even come close to it in comparison. For this need, God sent his one and only son into the world. God gave his only begotten son so that we would not perish, but have everlasting life. And God giving his son for this need was an act of love for us. For God so loved that he gave his one and only son. 
Listen to these words, quote, If we want proof of God's love for us, then look at the cross where God offered up his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Calvary is one objective, absolute, irrefutable proof of God's love for us. The Bible tells us that nothing can compare with the eternal joy of our names being written in heaven. God in love gave his son to bring that eternal joy about for his people. A man eagerly awaited the birth of his first child. And when it occurred, his son was born with an incurable birth defect, leaving him crippled for life. The father went to the Lord and said, Lord, Lord, let me be the crippled one. Let me be crippled instead of my son. Let me bear the infirmity. The Son of God bore our sins in his body on the tree. He took up our infirmities. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities so that by his wounds we are healed. And he did that because of his love for us. The first truth about God for us to store up in our hearts, to use as a weapon against the temptations to doubt God's love for us is God shows his love for us at Calvary. Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Truth number two. Truth number two is God shows his love for us through adoption. I'd like you to look now at 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Through God's grace, we have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And we who are believers, John tells us now, have been brought into the very family of God. By God's love, he has made us his sons and daughters. He is our God, and we are his creatures, but also he is our heavenly Father, and we are his children. Listen to John's words in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I have said to you before that God could have saved us from sin, but kept us at arm's length. He could have forgiven us, but let us only be slaves. 
However, through Christ and because of his great love, the Father has adopted us as his children. And he has given us the Holy Spirit to live within us, to testify to our spirit that we are indeed his children. It was said that in the Jewish household, slaves were not allowed to use the word father to address the head of the family. It was a word reserved only for the children. God has given us the Holy Spirit to live within us, to testify with our spirit that we are his children and to lead us to cry out in our hearts, Abba, Father, to God. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And listen to this, as our Heavenly Father, as incredible as it may seem, God takes great delight in us. Are you lacking people taking great delight in you? Our Heavenly Father takes great delight in each one of his children. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 in fact says, He rejoices over us with singing. That's delight. He rejoices over us with singing. He delights in us as a father delights in his children. Matthew Henry has said, the great God not only loves his saints, but he loves to love his saints. He not only loves you, but he loves to love you if you are a child of God. A number of years ago, probably when I was on a study leave, I attended a worship service with about 400 other people. And sitting in front of me were a mother and father and their newborn child. And oh, how they continually expressed love for their newborn child. And oh, how they continually delighted in their baby. How delighted they were with their baby. God delights in us as a parent delights in his children. That is how God is with us, only perfectly. Truth number two, God shows his love for us through bringing us into his family and rejoicing over us with singing. This afternoon, get aside, be alone, Think of God delighting in you and rejoicing over you with singing. Wow, that is something to consider. Truth number three, we are loved by God in Jesus Christ. Uh, Just to review, God shows his love for us at Calvary. God shows his love for us through adoption. And now we want to see in the Bible that we are loved by God in Jesus Christ. 
Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. Please turn there. From 1 John to Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me hit those closing words again. From the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Why does God love us? What is it that causes him to be eternally good to us? Is it because of something in ourselves? No. Praise God, no. The infinite, measureless love of God is poured out upon us, not because of who we are or what we are, but because we are in his Son, Jesus Christ. The love of God flows to us through or in Christ Jesus. The term in Christ is one that uh, Paul uses frequently to refer to our spiritual union with Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks of this same union in his metaphor of the vine and its branches in John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. Just as the branches are organically related to the vine in a life-giving union, so believers, in a spiritual sense, are united to Christ. And the Bible teaches us that because of this union, we are loved by God. God loves us in his Son. We are constantly tempted, Jerry Bridges says, to look within ourselves to seek to find some reason why God should love us. We usually find within ourselves, however, reasons why we think God should not love us. The Bible is quite clear that God does not look within us for a reason to love us. He loves us because we are in Christ Jesus. As he looks at us, he sees us united to his beloved son, clothed in his righteousness, and he loves us. Not because we're lovely in ourselves, but because we are in Christ. I've told some of you this story uh, more than once in the past, uh, a while ago, I was uh, on the campus of a university witnessing. And as I walked around, I, I, I came to a, a group of people uh, going into a, a building where there was an event. And so I went in. And shortly after I did, a person came up to me and wanted to know if I had any connections. I needed a connection with someone to be there. I told him I didn't, and I was told to please leave. As Christians, we have a connection to the Lord Jesus. In fact, 
the Bible says we are united to the Lord Jesus. And so point three about knowing God's love is God loves us in his son. And take this with you. God's love to us will never fail any more than his love for his son will ever fail. Will God ever cease, will the Father ever cease to love the Son? Will the Father ever diminish his love for the Son? Will the Father ever fail in his love for the Son? No, no, no. And the Father's love to us will never fail because we are in his Son. And the Father's love for the Son never fails. Here is my son, the father said in reference to Jesus. Here is my son, whom I love. We can say that the father says about us, and here are my children in my son, whom I love. Our last point today is this. We are loved by God with a sovereign love. We'll stay in Romans, and we'll look at Romans 8, verse 28. Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God reigns, God rules, God has the power to carry out his will, and he is, and part of his will is that in all things he will work for our good. In all things we will experience his love. We are loved by God with a sovereign love. I've told you this in the past. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Psalm 23, verse 6. It goes, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely, goodness and love will follow me. We are loved by God with a sovereign love. Listen to Isaiah chapter 40, verses 10 and 11. Verse 10. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm... Or, and his mighty power rules for him. Sovereign Lord, power, mighty power. But wait a minute, what, what, does, what does that mean for us? Verse 11, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. What does that mean for us? Sovereign love. Know God's love also through the truth that God loves us with a sovereign love. In Psalm 13, David is going through a time of great adversity. And he is struggling, I have read, with doubts. Doubts concerning God's love for him. He says in verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? 
What is the answer to doubting God's love for his people? What weapons can we use to overcome doubt? God shows his love for us at Calvary. God shows his love for us through adoption. We are loved by God in Jesus Christ. And we are loved by God with a sovereign love. Let's put it this way to help you to take this outline with you. What truths can we place in our minds and hearts to overcome the doubt of God's love for us? Calvary, adoption, union with Jesus, and sovereign love. May the Lord enable us to take these truths with us and to say what David went on to say in Psalm 13, verses 5 and 6. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us not to doubt your love for your people. Help us to not only be thankful for it, but to rejoice in reference to it and to live in it, to relish it, to so enjoy it that we honor you. Thank you. Thank you for your love for your people. And thank you for making us, through Jesus Christ, your people. In his name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus.
going to give the benediction. We will sing the threefold amen, and then I ask you to please be seated for the uh, deacons to uh, dismiss us uh, uh, as they have planned. The benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.